Praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. I said the Lord bless you. Promote you. Lift you up. Higher. Today, you'll get to a higher level. In Jesus' name. Naha Jesus. Father, we well, thank you today. We know you love everyone here. You have placed us in ministry. You placed us in a profession. And our Lord, we're asking everyone will be lifted up. Yeah. Every minister, every professional, every brother, every sister, every worker, Lord, lift your people up in Jesus' name. But thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We started a minister's conference on Friday. And we spoke about strength. Supernatural strength for the fainting. And the reason why the Lord is bringing the message on the Holy Spirit is that the church has limited the Holy Spirit. The children of Israel limited the Father. And the people of Israel at the time of Jesus, they limited Christ. The church today is limiting the Holy Ghost. And the only way we can have strength, supernatural strength, spiritual strength, abiding strength is that we have a new look, a new understanding, and a new approach to what we know about the Holy Spirit. I'm reading from Acts chapter 1. In Acts chapter 1, I'm looking at verse 4. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, ye have heard of me. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, not many days hence. Look at verse 8. In verse 8 it says, But ye shall receive power. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. You receive the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. You receive the power, and then it says, ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Please, you must hear with understanding what I come uh, to present to you. You must not allow the tradition of the past, the understanding of the past, the view of the past, and our denominational limitation to make us miss a Lord that God himself is sending to us. Look at that verse 8. But ye shall tell me out aloud. He didn't say, hear me out. Ye shall receive tongues. You know, tongues is part of what we receive. But the major, the central, the deep thing he brings to us is not, ye shall receive tongues after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And every time we talk on the Holy Ghost, somebody is thinking of shaking. Ye shall receive shaking. Every time we talk about the Holy Ghost, somebody is thinking about shouting and screaming. Every time we talk about the Holy Ghost, somebody 
somebody runs there, runs there, runs everywhere, you shall receive uh, the attitude of the athlete. No, ye shall receive power if there's anything missing in the church, the whole church. Whether it's, you know, the Council of Churches or whether it's Pentecostal Church, whether it's Deep Life or it's Baptist Church or whatever, it is the power. We have the tongues, we have the shaking, we have all the other things, the central thing that Jesus said, ye shall receive power. We lack that power. He says he shall receive power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, you are Bible preachers, teachers yourself. You mean, you know, that those two names mean the same thing. You, are, you have, you receive, you possess, you are energized, you are driven by the anointing of the Spirit the baptizing of the spirit and you are driven by the comfort of the spirit and the dynamite of the holy ghost and the empowering of the holy ghost the fructifying spirit that comes to bear fruit in our lives and then is the guiding spirit that draws us and drives us and directs us to the place of success and the healing spirit of the spirit that dwells and that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you. That spirit will quicken your mortal body because it dwells in you. He is the interceding spirit. And we shouldn't miss all that because we are pursuing tongues and tongues and tongues. Where is the anointing? And where is the burning spirit that burns every child out of our lives? And where is the comfort of the spirit when we're bereaved and when we suffer persecution, when we suffer misunderstanding, when people misunderstand and they misconstrue what we're doing? Where is the comfort of the spirit and where is the dynamite that blows everything, everything shakeable, shaking out of our lives? And where is the empowering, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit? Where is the fruit? You know, we've been laboring here for 30 years now. And we have maybe some 300, 400 people. And even those 300, 400 people are not stable. Where is the fructifying power, productivity of the Holy Spirit? And where is the guidance? Because you know what we did the other time, we do today. And the way we we did it the other time we do today. No improvement, no increase, no enlightenment, and there is no progress. And where is the guiding of the Holy Spirit that we don't go there yet? Come here. Then, after two years, go back to that Asia Minor. He needs to guide us. And where is the healing? of the Holy Spirit, because anywhere the Spirit of God is, there is healing, healing in our body. As you look at the, as you look at the church, the older elderly part of the church has the same challenge that the elderly people of the world have. As you know, we grow older, the, uh, seek, the seeker will also become when we were young, we were able to run here and there. But now, as the church is getting older, the dementia, the forgetfulness, and the cancer, and the, you know, whatever happens to older people in the world is happening in the church. And yet, when we have the fullness of the Spirit, the healing of the Holy Spirit and as the intercession, intercession of the Holy Spirit. Have you, have you noticed that we we'll pray? We we'll pray any prayer pattern we have gotten into from 1990, 1992, from 30, 40 years ago. When we pray, we pray exactly the same. It's registered like uh, tape 
in our mind and we rule out that thing. If we're praying in tongues, if that same tongue we roll out is recorded already there. If we're praying in our language, we rule out the same prayer. We've always prayed. Where is the intercession of the Spirit? That's the challenge I bring as we talk about waiting for the power by faith of the Spirit, the Spirit that God Himself outpours on us. We're looking at witnessing on the field, under the Spirit's oversight. Already He says in that Acts, Chapter 1, verse 8, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. What Holy Ghost? The joyful spirit. The joyful spirit. I want you to understand that those disciples were sorrowful. On the way to Damascus, what are you talking about that you seem so sorrowful? They were sad. What is it? What is God? They said, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you know what has happened? We're sad. We're sorrowful. And when sadness and sorrow, when they come together, it weakens your mind. It weakens your feet. It weakens your body. But... When you receive the joyful spirit, the joy of the Lord becomes the strength of your life. Those disciples, sorrowful, sad, they were locked up behind the door, behind the curtain. Because sorrow and sadness also brings fear. Look at what happened to our master. Look at what happened to the leader. And uh, if that happened to the green tree, what will happen to the dry tree? Because of that, they were fearful. It shall be witnesses unto me. No, they couldn't witness to anybody until the Holy Ghost comes and the joy of the Spirit, the joyful Spirit comes upon us as it came upon them. In Romans chapter 14, reading from verse 16, Romans chapter 14, we're looking at verse, at verse 17. Verse 17 tells us, Romans chapter 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And joy in the Holy Ghost. When you have a problem in your family, was sad, was sorrowful. When you are bereaved, you are sad and sorrowful. When you are disappointed by a most, the most trusted assistant, sad and sorrowful when somebody takes away the resources of the church and you know he probably says so and so it took church money to go and invest in a business and everything has collapsed and the fellow is not bringing the money back you are sad and sorrowful when you want to have ministry somewhere and then there's a blockage it appears that people they're not supporting not only they are not supporting they're even contradicting and resisting you are sad and sorrowful in that state of mind there's no way you will say i will do this i will do that the energy is taken away and the vision is taken away and the passion is taken away but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you we need the joyful spirit happy spirit it, you know something just happened uh, and that thing that happened uh, set your thinking <laughs> this is dangerous this is terrible am i going to survive this and then what you are thinking of that and you are stressed and you are depressed 
and it's God's grace that you don't even have, you know, depression. And you come to the pulpit, the joy of the Lord, that joy that blocks out everything you have heard, everything you have known, every news, bad news the world is giving you. It is that joyful spirit that makes you to be able to overcome and to fly, and to soar, and to proceed, and to progress, you progress in Jesus' name. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What power? It is the keeping spirit that makes us to have and to keep everything he has given us. You understand? It says that... Because Jesus said, I am the Son of God. And except you believe that I am He, you will not be saved. That language, Son of God, made the Israelites angry. Will kill him. He'll be crucified. Why? He has blasphemed. What blasphemy? He said, I am the son of God. And now the trial came. At the point of the trial, the, the high priest said, I adjure you. By the name of God, are you that person, the Christ? And Jesus answered, thou sayest. But you will see the son of man. That's the language they didn't want to hear. Come in. In the clouds of heaven. And Jesus told his disciples, go tell them, I'm going, it is finished, I've done the work I ought to do. Tell them, Christ is the Son of God. And there is no salvation in any other way, any other person, except through Christ, the Son of God. Hold on now. They killed him. Because he said, I'm the son of God. And the Israelites and the Sanhedrin and those people said, don't say that, please. Don't come here and tell us that Christ is the son of God. And they began to preach and they couldn't avoid saying that Christ is the son of God. They called them. Did we not strictly warn you, challenge you, command you that you must not even preach in this name? And he threatened them. And they just remembered what happened to Christ a few months now. And he threatened them. You say that again, your life will go for it. What helps them to keep that word, to keep that revelation? That Christ is the very Son of God. He shall receive power, the power to keep, the power to keep on preaching, saying the same thing you know, that the Pharisees and Sadducees said, you must not say. That the people of the world said, you must not emphasize in the keeping spirit. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 13 there. It says, hold fast. The sound, of, uh, the, the, hold fast the form of sound word, which thou hast heard of me in faith and in love, which is in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, that good thing, that gospel message, that salvation through the name of Jesus Christ, the only name that brings salvation, but there is no other name under heaven, in Israel, in any other nation, by which we must be saved, except the name of Jesus, this is the cornerstone that the builders rejected, but has become the head of the corner. How did they have the courage? How did they have the possibility? How did they have 
the understanding and the fortitude that they will keep that which everybody is uh, negative to. And it says over here, that which was committed unto thee, you keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. Well, if we only hold on to speaking in tongues, talking in tongues, conversing in tongues, praying in tongues, and we don't have the power to keep that which has been committed into our hands because we do not really have the keeping spirit, the joyful spirit. And when you are fearful and timid, you see, they'll do this to you if you talk like that again. And there are churches that believe holiness many years ago today because of the circumstances of life and because of what had happened to them and because of the disappointments they have and because of the general attitude by people, by members of their church. The members of their church, they are not just listening to him alone, they are listening to other people. And those other people said, Nobody, no one can be holy. And although he's preaching holiness, he's been preaching holiness with all his heart, all his soul, all his mind, all his knowledge, and all the examples and illustrations he can give. You see that the people are not listening to holiness message. All they want is healing. All they want is prosperity. And look at the man. It's now empty of the message of holiness. He cannot talk about that again. Why? He doesn't have the keeping spirit. The good thing you have, we keep by the Holy Ghost. And have you been preaching repentance? Are you still doing that? Have you been preaching restitution? Righteousness. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of his Christ, and the Pharisees he shall in no wise, in no way, get to the kingdom of God. If the word of restitution still coming from your mouth, and um, well, because you want those rich people to come, you want Zacchaeus to come and sit down there and to be able to say Zacchaeus is a member of my church. Is the Zacchaeus in your church born again? I see, you know, see have the grace and the power to say, half of my goods I give to the poor once they pay the ties to the church one over ten that's all but Zacchaeus said have five over ten I give not to the church I give to the poor and if I have taken anything anything or anyone if you stole another person's servant you saw that he was dutiful knowledgeable he's an expert and you visited their company, and then you begin to talk to him. Now you've taken him. And you know, your promise, what are they paying you here? I'll pay you double. You know how you stole the servant. If you have married another woman, second wife, and in the sight of God, he made the male one, female one, and the two, not the three, the two shall be joined together as one. But now, your first wife is still alive, and the second woman, I can't call her a wife, the second woman came in, and the third woman, you're on the way, and you're still preaching, and you're still saying, I am a Christian. Because our pastors themselves, they cannot emphasize that again. They do not have the keeping spirit that makes them to hold on to that good thing that was committed into their hands. And to keep that by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. When the Holy Ghost dwells in us, it'll show us we're going astray. It'll show us we're lowering the standard. It'll show us we're forsaking the Bible. It'll show us we're picking up just ideas 
around us today, but he shall receive power. You receive power. Amen. The power to stand. The power to say, here I stand. There's nothing else I will do. The power to keep everything the Lord has given you is the joyful spirit. He is the keeping spirit. L is the liberating spirit. You know, we all, as we're growing up in life, we all have habits we're picked up. We all have uh, some idiosyncrasies we picked up. And when you become a captain of the army, those idiosyncrasies and the things you used to do, you cannot do them anymore and fit into being the captain. When you become a leader in society, a leader in the local government, a leader in the, in the state, a leader in the nation, there's some private things you used to do. You cannot you know, continue in it, for example. In the past, before everybody knew you and before photographers were following after you to take your picture and send it to the world, before that came, you woke up in the morning and you took your long chewing stick and you put it in the mouth and you go around the yard and go everywhere having your long chewing stick there. Maybe that's okay for you, but now you are a public figure. Now you are somebody that the people are interested to find out how does he live? What does he do? You cannot take your long chain stick anymore and be going around and they take your picture and they show it to the whole world. When we become leaders, when we become ministers, when we become public figures in the kingdom of God, there are things the Lord has to liberate us from. Things the Lord has to liberate us from. And he's provided that. He is the liberating spirit. The liberating spirit. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes, innocently, a man seeing a lady, no bad thing in the heart, just embraces her or puts her hand around her neck. Didn't mean anything bad, but now it's a public figure. And when he does that and they show that to the world, they say, What kind of leader is this? World leader. Doesn't he watch other world leaders in different nations? You cannot do that again. There are things, they may be innocent things, but they will impact on. Your, on the way people view you, on the way people see you, and you are liberated from all those things. If the liberating spirit, it will liberate you. It will liberate us in Jesus' name. Now, if we cannot do those innocent things, because now I'm a minister of the gospel, and the church is watching, how I relate with single ladies, how I relate with married women, how I relate with those university teenagers. They're watching. They're not going to give excuse, or oh, it's a pastor, or oh, it's an evangelist. Hey, they know they will bring their own interpretation to what you do. That's why we need liberation from every appearance of evil. I will not just leave in, put your leg there, put your leg there, put your mouth there. Look at Romans chapter 8. I'm looking at verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Amen. In our nation and many nations around, they're shouting and talking about corruption. In our nation and many nations around, 
They are asking us questions when they have chance to ask us why. Is it that in our nation, the churches are multiplying, but there's more corruption in the church than ever before. What are you preachers doing? What are you pastors doing? Well, we pastors, we claim we have the Holy Ghost. But the Holy Ghost we have, and the Holy Ghost will talk in tongues and pray in tongues and run to the edge of the building, speaking in tongues and run over there and lie prostrate on the ground, demonstrating that we have the Holy Ghost and we're talking in tongues. But you know what we lack? The might of the Spirit, the courage of the Spirit, the fearlessness in the Spirit to address the corruption in the nation. Am I going to do that? If I address that in my local church and you address that, in your local church and he addresses that in the local church when we all having the mighty spirit when we announce that every time and when we tell the people are you a member of this church are you a part of the corruption in the world i want to tell you you are not born again they've never had that from you all they have always heard is everybody is born again and you are born again and i thank god because you are members of this church but now you are saying you have the might of the spirit the courage of the spirit and you're telling the people what you need to tell them Micah chapter 3 verse 8. In Micah chapter 3 verse 8, truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah said, I'm full of power by the Spirit of God. And I'm full of the might to declare unto my nation their sin and their transgression. When we truly have the Holy Ghost, it shall say power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses. You shall be witnesses of the Lord that all these uh, kind of righteousness, superficial righteousness, denomination right, denominational righteousness that our members carry about. I belong to Deeper Life. I belong to Assemblies of God. I, be I belong to Foursquare. I believe to the New Generation Church. I believe to this. I belong to this and that. But the corruption is in their life. The corruption is in their mode of walking. Then we pastors have not done well. Let's come back. It shall receive power. Today, it shall receive power. Amen. The power that will challenge everyone. Everyone that claims to be in the Lord and there is much in the corruption of the world. Truly, I am full of power by the Spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Now, how do we do that? We need to keep on being nourished by the Spirit. Uh, you know, it's not everybody that reads the Scripture that actually benefits from the Scripture. You know, you might have known people that are very dutiful and they read the Bible from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. And there is no uh, kind of regeneration and revolution in their lives. They read, <clears throat> they read, they read the Bible. But the Bible 
does not get inside them. When they get into trouble, they don't remember any promise. When they get into a compromising crossroad, they don't remember any commandment of the Lord. And when they come under pressure, they don't remember the strength, the power of the Holy Spirit. They collapse like they always collapse. But you know, when you read the Bible and the Holy Spirit takes the Bible and he puts it inside you, you will never be the same again. Yeah. Every time before you go out, not just that you read the Bible, not just that you memorize some verses of the Bible, and it's not just that you say, I know that, I know that, I know that. The question is, are you like Daniel? When he got from Judah, and now he's in Babylon. And the teacher didn't, you know, come with him to stay with him. His preacher, whoever his preacher was, did not come from Judah to stay with him there. But the Holy Spirit, you can't take the preacher everywhere, but you can take the Holy Spirit everywhere. You cannot take your counselor everywhere. Even in these days of the cell phone, you cannot always get a counselor. But you can always have the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the king's meat, neither with the wine which he drank. And so that purpose remained. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How could they know that they were going to face this fire, but they had read the Bible. When you go through the waters, they will not drown you. And when you go through the fire, it will not burn you. We have all read that, but when we get to that situation, that the Holy Spirit nourish us, reminds us, tells us, this is your time to show that that promise is real. He is the nourishing spirit. I pray he will nourish us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, sometimes a situation comes. Maybe they're expecting a preacher and he didn't find the preacher. And then they looked around. They saw that he was sitting there. They said, sir, tonight the uh, minister, the preacher is not here. So, please uh, come and address the people. What do you say? Are you so nourished that you have much of the word in your heart that you say, all right, I'll do it. And then you get up and you do it. I pray the Spirit will nourish you. I said the Spirit will nourish you. Some time ago, the students at the University of Ibadan, they invited a speaker, a preacher from England to come and hold a crusade. Then they approached me and they said, please, because you passed out at the University of Ibadan. And we all know you come to the crusade. You are not preaching, you sit at the pulpit. So that we can use your picture and draw the crowd. Because that man coming from Britain is not well known here. I said, all right. And so I went there not to preach, but to listen, to hear. Watch this man. I've never met him myself. What he will preach. And this particular night, I was there sitting at the pulpit. And uh, remember, I didn't come as a preacher. And the um, he preacher, he stood up. And he preached a good, clear salvation message. And he gave an altar call. And the people responded to the altar call. And then he prayed for salvation. 
and they took down their names like we normally do. And then, surprisingly, he said, tonight, I will not be praying for the sick, but, pastor, then he mentioned my name, will come and take over. He never told me a word of that before. What do I do? Here is the public, and the public people are waiting. Here is the evangelist, and he has mentioned my name publicly. Do I whisper to him that, you know, I didn't prepare for that tonight? I'm sorry, I'd like to do what you have said, but I don't want a showdown that, you know, no power, no inspiration, no miracle. No, I didn't say that. By the grace of God, I kept myself nourished by the Holy Ghost. You'll be nourished in the Holy Ghost. And so I got up and I took the microphone. He wanted me to pray for the sea. I took the microphone and pointed in that direction and said, young man there, you should have responded to the altar call. Here is your chance. Get up and repent. And then I pointed to another one. Pointed to another one. The evangelist from the UK. He was looking, was surprised. How did he know that those people had not responded? And they responded. Then I prayed with them. The sinner's prayer. Prayer of repentance. Everybody say praise the Lord. And then I said, now the Lord is going to heal the sick. How can you talk like that? With assurance. When you didn't prepare from home. You know why? John and Peter were going to the place of prayer, the temple at the hour of prayer. They didn't plan that they were going to tell that man at the beautiful gate, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And the man rose up and walked. And here was my chance. I didn't prepare for this. I said, now the Lord is going to heal you. Raise up your hand and lay your hand where you have the challenge. And then we we'll prayed. And after the prayer, I said, check up yourself. One man in that corner, he was totally blind before the eyes opened. And that other one was on wheelchair. He rose up and began to walk. And jubilation everywhere. Why? Because I kept myself nourished by the Spirit of God. That's what you need to do. What then happened is... That man, a member of the board of trustees of Elim Pentecostal Church, he took all those pictures and then he went to the board of trustees and said, I met a man and described everything and showed them the pictures and the board of trustees invited me to England and he called all their ministers together and said I should teach them five days on the gifts of the spirit. That opportunity came because I kept myself nourished by the Spirit of God. And today, I bring it to you. It shall see power. After the Holy Ghost is come upon you, that you have the joyful spirit, the keeping spirit, the liberating spirit, the mighty spirit, and the nourishing spirit. Uh, what do you have? You have the outpoured spirit. The outpoured spirit were told in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 17, and it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. Then he says that I will pour out, pour out, outpour pour out my spirit upon you, upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Where are the dreams of the old men and the old women? 
But if you're being involved in something in the afternoon, active in the afternoon, when you sleep in the night, you dream about that thing, you are active off in the afternoon. But when you come and you have this revealing spirit, and you have this reviving spirit, and say, Lord, I want to receive, not just receive tongues, but power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you wait upon the Lord, that Holy Spirit will be poured upon your life. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, and on my servants, and on my maidens, on my handmaidens, will I pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Did you say amen to that one? Yeah. Pour out of my spirit. As you look at, you know, members of the church today, start with deliverance churches. Those deliverance churches, their members are more conscious of Satan and evil spirit than the Holy Spirit. The deliverance minister talks more about the evil spirit, about the witches, about the wizards, about all those destructive spirit and he doesn't talk much about the spirit of God from heaven and you know in those deliverance churches they are more fearful of the devil than the normal old time historic churches why because the deliverance minister talks more about the other spirit. Why don't you turn around? They shall receive of my spirit. I will talk about the Holy Ghost. I will talk about the powerful, mighty Holy Ghost. And our message will change. Our administration will change. And even our members, the fear they used to have, they now know that Calvary has conquered Satan evil spirit and evil power and he has blown up the head and the center of activity by those evil spirits and i pray that you as a minister you will so talk about who you have the holy ghost that our people will not be fearful anymore in jesus name yeah. you're going to preach and then somebody uh, comes to you and he whispers to you and he says, Evangelist, Pastor, mind your words. There are some people there with human spirit. Those people are dangerous, dastardly. And so, and mind how long you preach because those people Whenever they threaten and they say, this is what we will do. I'm telling you, Pastor, you're a new person here. Those people will trust them. They will do what they say they will do. Sir, did you talk, trust the Holy Spirit? Did you trust the Holy Scriptures? That God, the mighty God of heaven, will do what he said he will do. I lost your amen. Yeah. And so we preachers, because of the news we're here, because of the information we're here, that those people with human spirit, they're so powerful, they're so mighty, we know them. But we also know beyond the human spirit we know the holy spirit and he says i'll put my spirit upon you you will overcome yeah. i said you will overcome yeah. p 
is the prevailing spirit. What will prevail? In Christ, what will prevail? By the spirit, what will prevail? Is the prevailing spirit. And it dwells on the inside of us. And then kill is the quickening spirit. The quickening spirit. When it comes into your life, you will not have slow, sluggish steps. My brother, I thought you said you got the Holy Ghost. Yes, I did. It's quickening spirit. Now, can you walk quicker? Uh -uh. You know my age. Can you move quicker? Uh -uh. I cannot do that. But you have the quickening spirit. Yes, I do. I doubt your confession. When the quickness spirit comes, it quickens us. We have passion. And we have dream. And we have vision. And that place we are going in the power of the spirit. I will get there. I will get there. You will get there in Jesus' name. The spirit we have is not the spirit that kills our spirit. It's not the spirit that slows us down. It's not the spirit that weakens us. It is not the spirit that makes us sick. Every information we hear that gets to our head makes us sick. Every kind of bad news we receive comes into us. It, make, it gets us down. You see, my brother, I cannot do anything now. My hands are weak because of that thing you told me. My feet, they're weak because of that thing you told me. And that thing I see there, and they tell me this is the interpretation. It weakens my soul that I cannot go again. The go-getter in me is now dead. No. When we receive the Holy Spirit, it's the quickening spirit. It will quicken you in Jesus' name. You are on, you will not be weary. You walk, you will not faint. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also also, also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. He quickens us and makes us to walk quicker, speak faster, and think clearer because that spirit abides in us. That spirit will abide in you. That's the essence of having the Holy Ghost. Speak in tongues, good. Go beyond that. I speak in tongues, I speak in tongues. Pastor, can I speak in tongues for you? Mm -mm, don't speak in tongues for me. Show me the power. Show me the joyful spirit. And show me the keeping spirit. And show me the mighty spirit. Show me the nourishing spirit. Show me the overcoming spirit. Show me the prevailing spirit. And show me the quickening spirit. And show me the reviving spirit. When we have the spirit of God, revive us. The revival we are praying for, revive me, O oh Lord, revive our church, O oh Lord, revive everyone. That revival will come through the spirit that comes to abide and dwell in you. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Jesus said, Wait in Jerusalem until you be baptized 
for the Holy Ghost. For not many days is you receive the Holy Ghost. And it says you shall receive power. Not only tongues, it shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and also in Abba, the uttermost part of the world. Rise up now, that reviving spirit is here. It will revive every one of us. It's the burning spirit. It'll burn every child out of your life. Quickening spirit, it'll quicken you. It'll give you passion. You walk, you run, you're not fit, you'll not be weary. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. <laughs>